So as you've learned quite a bit about ethical hacking, you've certainly learned that there's a lot of different parts of a penetration test. There's enumeration, there's footprinting, there's hacking, there's compromise, there's building your credentials and actually exploring out, uh, building nefarious network maps, all of those things. So there's a lot of different data that you've gathered, a lot of tests that you've performed, some that have failed and some that have succeeded. Within the context of this particular video, these tests are all part of what we're going to call a security assessment. And the security assessment is kind of just an overarching term for everything that's happening here. And typically, the results are asked for by whoever is engaging the security assessment as both a written report and supporting presentation or supporting PowerPoint. Oftentimes, this is a combination where there's a written deliverable and an oral deliverable or a series of presentations, some for IT pros, some for management and so forth. Sometimes there's more than one written report or sometimes it's a large Uber report that's delivered that the client may then segment out, split up, do whatever they think is appropriate. And that'll depend a lot on internal structure, a lot on need to know or, or data restriction and so forth. But all of this, all of these decisions, all of these uh, thresholds, all of these uh, different types of deliverables need to be defined right up front. And they have to be defined as part of the process really before we even begin doing any enumeration or footprinting. Otherwise, we don't know as ethical hackers that we're actually moving towards the right goal. We don't know that we're gathering the right information, we're in the right way, or capturing the right documentation to de deliver what the client is looking for. So understanding this stuff up front is absolutely critical. A lot of the security professionals out there actually consider the word process to be kind of a cuss word, kind of dirty, don't want to talk about process, don't want to actually define it. They don't want to be limited or bound. Well, in ethical hacking, I have found that it's far more useful to have a process to have documentation, to have agreement on things before you begin, because you are using techniques and tools that could be considered by a lot of folks to be malicious or illegal in some cases. You've seen in other videos where some of these tools can be used for pretty nasty things. So having some kind of overarching process or do and documentation that go into that is important up front for things like understanding what data will be gathered and what data intentionally will not be gathered. Some clients may, for example, not want individual usernames to be gathered or individual computer names to be gathered. So during the footprinting process, it's important to do some activities that will actually result in that kind of data, machine names or usernames, but then you either don't record them or you intentionally purge them from notes and from documentation before it's actually delivered. I've mentioned throughout all of these videos defining scope, understanding what the ethical hacking process is going to cover and what it's not going to cover. Hacking databases is not the same as hacking web servers. Hacking domains is not the same as hacking client machines. If there's a specific scope, for example, the client wants you to examine their web front end for potential vulnerabilities, that's great. That doesn't mean you should start breaking into their corporate network or start attacking Wi-Fi. That's simply not an appropriate approach. First of all, it's not going to get the job done that you've been engaged to do. But even more importantly, it could be considered nefarious activity, could land you in jail or with a lovely lawsuit on your hand. So you want to stay away from exceeding scope. But the only way you can stay away from exceeding scope is by defining scope. If you don't documented as part of the process, you don't know if you're exceeding scope and they don't know if they're, if you're exceeding scope. And then it's a, he said, she said, and the worst time to get into that is after a particularly successful attack where you've compromised a password or you've infected a, a key system with malware. You thought it was within scope because you're an ethical hacker. They thought it was outside of scope and now you've got a problem. Along with that is the concept of authorization, knowing who is able to authorize an ethical hacking assessment process and then getting that written authorization, having them actually sit down and say, yes, you are okay to do these things within this time frame on these machines, defining the scope and then getting actual sign off on that scope, as well as defining when 
payment is going to happen. So assuming that you are not directly working for the company that you're doing the process on, assuming that you're not just a salaried employee, you know, straight up, in which case this doesn't make a lot of sense in that context, but coming in as a consultant or as a freelancer or as a work for hire, you want to know that you're going to get paid and you want to know you're going to get paid regardless of the results. So giving someone really, really bad results and then asking them for money in order to hear those bad results, not a good combination. You want all of that defined up front. I will get paid 50% upon completion of this footprinting and enumeration process. And I will get paid another 50% at this point or that point. This kind of thing is crucial because I have had experience where some folks just don't like bad news. And honestly, if you're withholding the deliverable until they pay you and they're withholding payment until you make the deliverable something they want to hear, you're going to be stuck in a really bad space. So forgive the hackneyed phrase, but pro tips for assessment process. So honestly, I would never begin any kind of ethical hacking process without something defined. I would never start just enumerating or start looking at Wi-Fi or start looking at where where are the open Ethernet ports. I would never even look into a company in any significant way or even any cursory way until there's something defined. What am I looking at? What am I supposed to look at? So no process, no assessment, no authorization. So I don't have official written sign off in a way that makes me and potentially an attorney or my insurance company happy that I'm not taking liability for what I do. As long as I stay within the scope, no assessment. And speaking of the, the concept of scope, no contract with terms and scope defined, again, no assessment. I need to know what I'm supposed to be looking at, what I'm not supposed to be looking at. Uh, the 911 number, the emergency number that is going to get me out of trouble if I touch a system that's out of scope, I need that. The only way to define that number, really, or define that even that concept is to say, these are the things that are in scope, these are the things that are out of scope, and should something get touched that's out of scope, that's not supposed to be touched during this process, here's the process I'm going to follow. I'm going to call this person or I'm going to send an email or I'm going to run screaming out of my office uh, and just desperately try to find someone. Whatever that is, defining that up front is crucial. It will make whoever is the target much more comfortable because they know that you're being bound by certain parameters and they also know that should you exceed those parameters, you know who to contact immediately. Oftentimes, this is going to be someone in senior management or someone that's on a 24 by 7 available basis, or it may be a help desk, a 24 by 7 staffed help desk. Whatever it is, that kind of, of scope and approaches to remediation, if you exceed scope, absolutely critical. I would never start any kind of assessment process without those.